Hello and welcome to the In Publishing podcast, bringing you weekly insights into the newspaper and magazine publishing sector. I'm Kia Byrne, and this week my guest is Richard Butterworth, Commercial Director of Chemical Watch, which provides independent intelligence and insight to product safety professionals managing chemicals. We would like to thank our podcast sponsor, Acorn Web Offset, the Yorkshire-based specialist A5 and A4 magazine printer. With high-speed web offset and sheet-fed printing, together with in-house saddle stitching, perfect binding and mailing services, Acorn can cope with the most demanding of production turnarounds. Acorn prides itself on its efficiency and low-cost print production. For more information, visit acornweb.co.uk. Richard Butterworth is Commercial Director at B2B intelligence brand Chemical Watch, where he has overseen the transition from a subscriptions to a membership model. Richard, welcome to the In Publishing podcast. Uh, Thank you, Keir. Delighted to be here. Firstly, can you tell us about your journey to where you are now? Because I believe you've had quite a, done quite a number of things in your career. Uh, yeah, that's one one way of putting it. Yes. Um, yeah. Now, I, I I spent probably the first half of my career working for an assortment of um, smaller startups in the uh, the digital publishing software and training arenas. I think perhaps one of the most um, one of the most interesting roles there was uh, the, in in the early days was director of a, a subsidiary of Chivers Press, which was a large large print and audio book publisher. And we were forging um, new ground, really digitizing and securely securely dig- distributing audio books, uh, which were published by some of the world's uh, larger publishers back in the 90s, uh, late 90s and early 2000s, which as I'm sure a lot of um, your listeners will will remember was pretty um, a pretty bumpy ride for dot com businesses at that time. So that that was a lot to there was a lot to learn um, in in those early years. Um, so yeah, mo- most of my experience was in the senior roles in smaller businesses, generally uh, marketing and operational roles. And it, it wasn't until uh, mid 2012 that I joined Chemical Watch, which was then just five years into its uh, into its journey. Um, as their head of marketing um, before subsequently taking responsibility for the sales function four years later in 2016 and and then having sort of brought in capable successes to manage the uh, the growing sales and marketing functions I was later offered the role of uh, commercial director uh, along with a seat on the board about 18 months ago and and my my responsibilities really over the last uh, I'd say two or three years have, have really been to help drive the growth of, of the Chemical Watch business and, and recently leading, as you said, our, our transformation from subscriptions to high value membership, which resulted in an almost uh, 50% increase in recurring revenues. So, I, I mean, that, that's really interesting. Um, you, can you talk us a little bit more between, uh, through the difference between uh, the two different models and why you decided to go down the high value membership route? Hmm. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take those questions in reverse, actually, I think the, yeah. the, the, the why, um, first of all, um, really was, I think, something of an inflection point in, in, in 2017. Um, it, w- it was the coming together of some strategic drivers at that time, you know, the, the, um, the drive for deeper, higher value relationships with our customers and for recurring revenue growth, combined with uh, reflections, really, at our 10 year anniversary. We, we were founded in 2007. Um, and so as well as calls for celebration, that 10 year anniversary was the time to really take stock of the business and uh, a, a growing recognition that a lot, a lot had changed over the first 10 years. Um, the regulatory agenda, the functional maturity of our customers and with that their specific needs. The technology landscape obviously had changed enormously, as had the competitive landscape. And there was a, a realization that, um, in fact, the, the, the riskiest strategy that we could adopt at that time was to assume that we could just carry on as we were and that we'd still be able to effectively meet our, our customers' needs for the next 10 years. So the, the decision was made um, at that point, that convergence of strategic objectives and a, a realization of where we were, that uh, we needed to disrupt what was a perfectly healthy business uh, and to, to move to something different, which, uh, which it turned out was, was membership. So if that was the catalyst, the, the difference for Chemical Watch, and obviously it'll 
there'll be um, there'll be subtle variations, you know, between different businesses, of course. But for us, the differences between um, uh, subscriptions and membership were really that where Chemical Watch used to offer offer a, a, a disparate mix of subscription products and services, which is sort of we'd iterated our way to after ten years of business. Uh, the new membership proposition gave us license to do away with the prescriptive product wrappers, as I would call them, which really, when it came down to it, meant more to us internally than it, than they actually did to our customers. And and instead of focusing on products, to, to focus on one holistic service, absolutely driven by customer needs and, and a desire to maximize the value and ROI for our members. And that switch from being product-led to customer value-led was really um, crucial and, and a key difference, I think, in terms of you know wh- where we position what we do. Another key difference is that that membership for us emphasizes the community and the the networking acts aspects of of what we do. Um, membership infers, of course, you know, belonging to some kind of communicate uh, community and, and and ideally participating in it. And it is very much um, a, a two-way exchange uh, that we encourage, you know, our, our um, our members to enjoy as part of their membership. So, you know, that 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 um, really resulted in uh, us achieving what, you know, what strategically we were trying to achieve in building deeper relationships with our best customers, moving further up the value chain in terms of proposition and resulting ultimately in higher recurring revenues. Well, you've talked there about customer value um, and the two-way process, and customer insight is central to a membership model. Can you tell us more about how you gathered information about your customers' requirements? Mm. Yeah, it was a really important part, actually, of, of, of the, um, the months running up to our transformation. Um, the, early, the early sort of six months, I would say, of the, of the project were, were spent um, deep diving into what we um, knew and understood about our customers and, and sort of seeking to understand more. Um, to which end, we, um, we employed a, an external agency to uh, conduct um, you know, customer interviews um, and they produced some fantastic insights about how we were perceived and, and where the gaps were. Uh, we conducted our own um, internal research alongside that. So that was quantitative surveys, uh, qualitative meetings with customers, you know, customer insight meetings. Um, we pulled together a lot of existing data and, and knowledge across the business, um, easily overlooked in, in a research project, but we, we already knew an awful lot. So we needed to sort of um, circle back over that. Um, we formed a, a, an advisory panel uh, made up of some of our key customers to help um, you know, st- steer us uh, towards the right uh, membership proposition. Um, and you know, through through all of that research, external and internal, we created a customer needs map, which was really our our roadmap for what it was that we needed to deliver uh, in in the sort of the re- reimagined service. And and off the back of that needs map, a series of use cases, which were sort of describing how uh, practically our users would be trying to achieve those ends described by the the needs map. And we had actually about 200 of those use cases, which, you know, were sort of stepping through somebody trying to achieve a task in their day-to-day roles. And we distilled those down to about 20 key use cases, which along with the needs map then went into, um, you know, went, went into um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the planning of, of our new service. And the, the other, the other thing was, at every step of the the process, um, you know, through the the redesign and transformation of the, the service, we were careful to sort of pause and, and validate our thinking at each step with uh, with our customers. A good example of that was one of the stages, the um, the U the UX uh, stage, redesigning the sort of the the design response, if you like, to delivering content to our members uh, in response to those use cases. We we actually brought in. Um, a, a group of, of key customers sat them down in front of a video camera and gave uh, those users a prototype of the um, the UX and um, those use cases and said, "Show us how you'd achieve these ends using this new service." And, and we we recorded them trying to do that, and obviously we were able to learn a lot from um, you know a lot from those sorts of um, that's that customer input that validation. Um, I think beyond beyond the the research, I would I would also point out that. You know, it's an ongoing process, um, and it and it actually it actually 
um, required quite a lot of um, additional work within the business. For example, we we reorientated the, the business management function around customers' needs as we understood them. So we went from running the business through what were product teams, um, as you can imagine, subscriptions, events, advertising, and so on. Uh, we, we changed that to customer teams. So we're now running the business through the lens of, of, of customers. And we appointed a, a CCO who, who leads the charge, really, um, to, to meet those customer needs and to communicate customer insights across our whole business. We, we formed a new uh, customer success team, which is providing an, an enormously valuable feedback from our high-value customers. And we've made some significant investments in tech to, again, generate those insights that we need to continue to uh, sense check, are we delivering what we should be? So, for example, a customer data platform that looks at um, how and, and how and uh, the breadth and depth of engagement across our member accounts just to make sure that we're, you know, they're getting the returns that we would expect from the, uh, from the service. Right, right. And so with the customer at the heart, what were the other key staging points along the way um, in developing the membership model? For example, the design, the tech, obviously mm. those touch on customer, but, but they go beyond that as well. Yeah, I think, gosh, there were there were a lot of really um, key um, touch points, I would say, that we worked through in, in redesigning the service. I've mentioned restructuring already. That was that was a, a, an important um, early early change that we made. The, the service redesign itself, I think, in response to the customer needs map and those use cases, that that took a few months of you know really reimagining what it was that we were um, we were going to offer in response to those needs. And so I mentioned talking, you know, taking all of the, uh, the 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 content that we're offering, the insight that we're offering out of its prescriptive wrappers. You know, we we put it all together on the table in one big uh, amorphous blob, metaphorically speaking, and and challenged ourselves with the the task of you know creating more value um and better meeting those customer needs that we'd identified with that same content and and obviously then also supplementing that content with um, additional content where we where we felt it fell short um so the service redesign itself was a big project the, the, the technology investments you you just mentioned um were you know in some cases quite significant and, and drove a lot of value in terms of the, mem- the the membership value prop so um one was uh, semantic fingerprinting which uh, is a whole <laughs> whole other discussion, but basically uh, drives an enormous amount of um, value in the existing content that we have. Um, a diagnostic tool um, we we invested uh, with a, with a partner to create that to help benchmark and signpost um, best practice for our members. We've, uh, as I mentioned already, invested in data tools as well, so the CDP and good customer data. These have been really instrumental in making a success of the membership proposition. We we've invested in world class UI UX. Um, we'd never done that before, but partnering with somebody that was a, a real expert in that, an agency that was an expert, has made uh, for a much, much better uh, realization of our vision in terms of um, the service. On, on certainly on the um, on the on the web on the website side, on the platform side, the platform itself, the development phase, you know, that was a complete replatforming. So we went from lots of sort of news magazine style uh, subscription products to a single central membership proposition online with a platform that felt. Uh, well, it was much more um, in line with um, our customers' needs today, uh, and 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 gave us really a foundation on which to build over the next ten years. We um, we carried out a full rebrand um, to help us really land the new value proposition and to make it clear to our audience that we you know this wasn't yet another iterative you know subscription product. This was something completely new and different, and this was a new chemical watch. We did a lot of pricing strategy rework. Um, we went from a subscriptions or seat-based uh, pricing model to an enterprise-wide value-based pricing model, which was a really significant um, change. And then there was the actual, you know, the, the rollout, the, the, the relaunch of the service, the repositioning. And that was internally as well as externally, by the way. You know, there was a lot of work to do to make sure that our, our own staff really fully yeah, understood the change. Um, and with that, I think a balancing act in terms of, you know, wanting to get the new service to market, you know, quickly, um, but at the same time, making sure that it was fully formed and, and um, you know, did justice to the new proposition. So there was a minimum viable product consideration in all of that. When do you push the button? When do you start rolling it out and, and continue, obviously, developing it alongside? Beyond that, migration was a key stage for us in rolling out that new membership. So taking our existing subscribers to 
membership and that's that's taken you know a good a good year to 18 months to sort of affect that shift um and finally the 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 renewals you're know, seeing having moved people migrated our our audience to membership seeing that first year of renewals coming in was obviously is is obviously enormously uh, reassuring to see that it's that it's stuck and, and that that our members are seeing full value so you've been through an enormous period of change um for other publishers considering going down a similar path and completely reevaluating what they do and and, and moving to a, a similar membership model what are the do's and don'ts that you would identify mm. um there are a lot of lessons that we learned and some of them are specific to membership perhaps some of them are more um, general but um hiring hiring good people um it sounds really obvious but i i would say don't don't assume in that that your existing teams necessarily have the skills that you'll need and we've we've recognized that we've needed to invest in uh, new and uh, highly skilled people um, across the business really to support the the move to membership um i would say um partner well um don't feel compelled to to try and do it all in house you know we we partic- in particular we we're, we're not a technology business but we've managed through good partnerships to really elevate our game in terms of the, uh, the 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 technical investments that we've made um and they've you know they are like i say creating significant additional value so um partner well and i think on on partnership also um look for others who've already walked the path we we benefited for finding um other businesses similar to our own but non competing who'd been on a similar journey uh, and we were able to um to to um you know spend time with those businesses and understand you know what they would have done differently and and uh, some you know, learn, learn about some of the um, the wins and losses that they they had experienced before going into the process our, ourselves um investing good data um i think eliminating the guesswork where you can so uh, that's more of a post you know, rollout consideration for me it's about uh, making sure that you've got good customer insights but also making sure that you've got good customer data um so that you can target the conversation within customer organizations or prospect organizations so uh, feeding into your sales process um establish uh, a customer advisory panel um i i mentioned that we formed a, a customer advisory panel to sort of guide us towards that membership proposition it's a really great way of obviously getting close to your customers and of course you know in in the expectation that some of that that panel of customers guiding the membership proposition will in fact be among your first members of course so um it's a it's a great uh, great thing to do if you can some challenges there um be realistic about your expectations on how how much time you can expect that panel to um, to to commit that was one of the the challenges that we experienced um think about customer intimacy um, so customer success um, and and and, and um, getting your experts in front of customers has become increasingly important to us uh, with a higher value membership proposition. It's it's necessary often to engage with our analysts or our our um, our subject matter um, experts on the journalistic side, journalism side of the editorial team um, to to really you know demonstrate the 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 quality of the uh, the, the service that we're able to provide. Um, and I think another I would say is get a get a really good handle on the read across um, from customer needs uh, to service deliverables to value. And if you and particularly your sales and marketing teams have got a, a really good handle on on that value and you're able to articulate the 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 you know the, the value that you can deliver in response to those customer needs, uh, it, it it will inevitably uh, result in higher yields, and you, you're more likely to back yourself when it comes to um, to pricing. Uh, and my final my final um, um, recommendation would be that these kinds of root and branch transformations, you know, for us it was a complete transformation. Th- these are rare opportunities to um, to to price correct, which I've heard a lot talking to other B two B publishers who've you know, grown over the years and, and have sort of suffered as a result of being tethered to a low pricing point uh, on day one. It's difficult to sort of disconnect or decouple um, the, the, uh, the, the the pricing. Um, so these are great opportunities to do that. And, and, and I highly recommend that, that, uh, that people take them. 
Uh, great, great. And in terms of sales and marketing uh, and those all important renewals, how does selling memberships differ from selling subscriptions? Mm. Um, I think on, I'll sort of deal the marketing side first. I think we, I would say fundamentally we're now concerned with accounts as prospects rather than individuals. Um, and the reason for that is because we're now selling enterprise-wide um, access to to our membership. So for us, we've we've made a, a significant step change there. We consider an account in in the round. So we're looking at breadth and depth of engagement across an account. We're looking at the the, the account firmographics um, to to understand whether it's a good fit for for what we have to offer. So we're considering the sector, the size, the locations in which they operate, the jurisdictions. Um, and so we're making much more um, considered um, decisions on which are the accounts that we want to pass from marketing to the uh, business development team. Um, as such, it, it, it's, it's less transactional. So it's, it's more about quality over quantity. Um, I would say still, still on the marketing side that we're not quite at full ABM, account-based marketing, but we're heading very much in that direction with the higher value membership proposition. Um, there are some challenges there as well. I think that, you know, it is a uh, one membership proposition, um, but there's a lot within that. And and so there are there are some resultant challenges articulating the full value of that proposition um, with, you know, only limited bandwidth uh, from, from your customers. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're addressing, I would say, all of the above challenges with, with pretty much the same uh, marketing team as we had prior to, to membership. So it hasn't led to any significant resource uh, requirement, new resource requirements on the marketing side. On the sales side, I, I would say more disruptive, um, particularly when you're looking at the higher value membership tier. We have two tiers of, of membership. Uh, and that's really seen root and branch change. You know, we've we've had to form a new business development function. We've had to recruit a, an entirely new consultative sales team who can uh, navigate, you know, international cross-departmental buying committees, uh, including procurement. Um, we've we formed a new custom success function to deliver the higher value of uh, post-sale service that we that we need uh, to evidence value delivery. Um, we've had to invest in new sales systems and, and processes. So, pr- pretty mu- pretty fundamental stuff, really. Um, and but like the marketing, it's much more strategic now. The activities on on the sales side are more strategic than they they were previously for subscriptions and and also a lot more now that we're coming to the end of that migration of existing members it's it's much more um, outbound focus for us um so th- th- those are probably the key changes across sales and marketing you mentioned the importance of having really good data sets particularly post this transition what are your main uh, kpis um that you use to track your membership activity um I would say it will come as no surprise that renewals is is really the the, the number one. You know, we're, we're 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 tracking renewals rate renewal rates through the year. Um, the other is engagement. I mentioned that we're looking holistically at accounts, so we're tracking breadth and depth of engagement, identifying you know who who the advocates are within our member accounts, how how and in what way they're using our service. Um, and the third key capture for us is is value evidence of value delivery again particularly for our higher value members the customer success team um, at the start of a a membership term will create a um, a customer value plan and that customer value plan asks the customer you know what does success look like for you in 12 months um if we get to 12 months and you look back how, how will we know that we've we've delivered what you you needed and with through that consultation as part of the onboarding process, we we map out a plan for what it is that we need to deliver to to basically ensure renewal. So we're set, setting ourselves up from day one to to win the renewal. And then through that year, uh, the customer success team are regularly touching base with those key contacts within our member accounts to um, to talk about what we've delivered in under those um, value delivery headings and to evidence value delivery. So. It's two things. It's the quantitative bit. Have we delivered what we said we're going to deliver? So not only access to the information, but, you know, um, delegate places at our conferences, training, e-learning, access to our analyst team, analyst hours, support, 
uh, custom insight projects and so on, the, the, the nuts and bolts of their, their membership have we delivered, but also testing from the top down those key value assumptions. I mentioned that read across. You know, we, we have assumptions that um, our service will help uh, businesses create value in a number of ways. And um, what, what we're keen to explore in those conversations with customers is, are we right in those assumptions? If so, why? And, and again, to capture that evidence so that we're, we're effectively over the course of 12 months building the business case for renewal. And at, at you know, month 10, um, we, can, we can turn that, um, that business case around and reflect back or play back to those uh, member accounts. Here is how you've told us in your words that we've delivered value for your business over the last 12 months. Uh, and, and here is your onward justification for the renewal internally. So those are the, those are sort of the, the the key areas that we're looking at in terms of um, in terms of KPIs to 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 track our members' uh, engagement. Now that you've made this switch to a membership model, what are the challenges and objectives ahead for you? You've you've mentioned renewal, but beyond that, what other challenges are you facing? So many challenges, <laughs> well, particularly mm. obviously in current climate, but. Um, I'd say one of the, the really interesting ones for us is the brand stretch. I mentioned that we'd rebranded and repositioned the service. And our, our new brand promise sits on, on three pillars, which are inform, connect, transform. And, and since 2007, Chemical Watch has consistently delivered the, the inform piece really well. You know, we've, we've, we've helped businesses de-risk by providing the insight and intelligence they need for proactive uh, compliance. Um, We've also served the connect piece very well. You know, we provide access to our unique community of experts globally. But the new piece, the the transform, is the brand stretch. And this is really about us helping our members move beyond merely compliance and to create value through best practice compliance in, in much the same way, I suppose, as um, functions like IT or HR or procurement historically have moved from you know, being seen as a cost center within businesses to a value driver. And, you know, it's still relatively early days for the compliance function in terms of its maturity. You know, uh, it's only really 2006, 2007 that these functions came into existence. But there is an increasing recognition among the more dynamic and proactive of our members that uh, there's an opportunity there for value creation within their business by pursuit of best practice. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're working on that question. You know, what does best practice look like and what do the returns look like practically in terms of shareholder value? Uh, how will our customers, our members know when they get there? So tools like our, our benchmarking and diagnostic tool will you know, help plot a course for our members. Uh, we're, we're exploring how can we better disseminate best practice through our conferences, our training, our roundtables and so on. And we're, we're thinking um, about, you know, how can we hold up great example, examples or case studies of best practice, um, perhaps at our uh, annual awards that we're, that, that we're planning. Uh, so we're on something of a mission there to, to help our members move to best practice. And that's, that's a real challenge that we're, we're, we're grappling with. Um, I think additionally, on a practical level, we recognize there are a number of customer needs that we can, uh, we can uh, additional customer needs really, that we can meet as part of our holistic membership. So there is obviously room for expansion of that single membership offering to to address uh, more needs and to address existing needs better. So we're, we're planning continued service development. Um, and I think the, the, the other key challenge for us right now is is scale. You know, we now that we feel we've we've got the a truly market leading service uh, that's fit for the next 10 years. You know, we, we've got a, we recognize we've got a long way to go um, to really capture our target market you know we serve global upstream chemical companies downstream manufacturers basically any any manufacturer that creates a product that contains chemicals so 96 or so percent of the world's products so it's a huge downstream market uh, also service providers to the industry and other stakeholders so regulators and ngos and trade associations and so on so we've got a we've got a you know fantastic offering great success proven model we now we're now looking to um, to really to really grow that over the next few years you mentioned the current climate how has chemical watch been impacted by covid and what lasting impact do you expect it to have on your business it's a 
it's a moving picture. <laughs> um, thankfully, you know, since March, you know, the business has proven to be very resilient. And on, on, on an operational level, um, half of our staff were already remote working anyway. So, that, so the transition for us to remote working was a pretty painless one, to be honest. Um, on a commercial level, our renewals are, are absolutely uh, unaffected. Um, I think, like any B two B business, we've had some challenges getting hold of new prospects early in the early in the sales pipeline. Um, but we seem to be moving past that. I, I say that um, despite the uh, the fact that um, obviously the the, the COVID crisis is um, looking like it's um, it's heading towards a potential second peak. We'll see. Um, um, and our our events, which for us are a, a key key you know key part of what we do supporting our membership proposition fundamentally but obviously a, a, an important revenue line in their own right they're, they're performing well as virtual events um really due to the the technical need to have nature of of the content um i think beyond covid on the events front we'll, we'll certainly be looking at a um a a hybrid events model so more of a mix of offline online audience um due to the success that we've seen with with our virtual program um, and beyond that, we're, we're also seeing some really exciting opportunities emerging from the current situation to accelerate the, the move from ad hoc event delegate spend to a recurring membership component. And we're, and we're currently in the process of trialing a new service that offers our members enterprise-wide access to our year-round professional development content output so that includes conference output training e-learning webinars uh, meetings videos and, and, and all sorts of other content that's spread through the whole year and we're delivering that through a, a bespoke virtual conference venue complete with networking functionality so we're we're really excited about the potential there that's um, that's that's presented itself or it's accelerated by current conditions in 2018, you spent a year as a firefighter, I believe, and, and you've also worked for the um, RNLI in the past. What led you to do those things and what was it like? I, I'm, I'm laughing because you've you obviously really done your research, Keir. Um, <laughs> I guess, um, yeah, they're, they're slightly um, slightly odd, I'm sure, <laughs> to look at, but it was really a, a born out of a, a desire to take myself outside my comfort zone, really, you know, to test myself. and. Um, also you know, to, to do something that felt like I was giving something back. And I found, um, I found both experiences, uh, both with the RNLI and the, and the uh, South Wales uh, Fire and Rescue Service, among the most reward, rewarding things I've ever done. Um, they, they were both enormously humbling and uh, they've left me with a, a pretty healthy sense of perspective, I would say, you know, when things are feeling particularly uh, challenging in my day-to-day -day role. Um, they, they they have um, provided you know, some really important perspective. Um, I would add, I mean, a, a, along along the same lines of stretching yourself, I would say, Keir, that far more terrifying than either the uh, the fire service or R and I was um, agreeing to perform in a, a, an Alan Akeborn play last year, never having acted before in my life. Now that that was really scary. Yeah. <laughs> and how did that go? It was great. Yeah, I I, I was. Um, I absolutely was 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 absolutely terrified, but um, but loved it at the same time. So, uh, yeah, de definitely definitely one for um, you know putting myself outside my comfort zone. Coming back to the B two B sector as a whole, um, what do you expect the key trends to be over the next five years? Um, looking, I'd say looking at the B two B publishing sector specifically, I'm I'm seeing a number of trends and opportunities. A few um, I'd pick out one. I'd say high value content. I think for any business, whether it's a high quality journalism led business like ours or a business providing premium market insights or big data solutions, I, I think there's a huge opportunity for premium quality uh, now more than ever, really, given the, you know, the information overload that so many businesses are struggling with. There's no shortage of information. It's just you know, providing something that can cut through all of that noise and provide you with you know, the, the information you really need uh, carries a, a premium, a uh, trusted source. I think um, journalistic content specifically you know, for us remains a fantastic opportunity to create a distinct voice to add value by providing editorial insights and judgment, you know, the, the tell me what I need to know and nothing more piece. Um, I think 
that that type of content can offer the forward view. Um, so what do we think is coming next rather than simply as perhaps a, a pure data play uh, can only serve as a you know, rear view mirror. We, we, we can, through our journalistic uh, insights, provide that forward view, which is invaluable, certainly for customers like ours dealing with you know, upcoming regulatory challenges. Um, it, it's um, also that interpretation of what does this actually mean for me, you know, making sense of, of often uh, technical information, um, distilling it so that people can actually act upon it. Um, I think that quality content can help position your brand as a trusted, impartial source within your community, still, still talking about you know, journalistic approach, really. And ultimately, it can help build and maintain a defensible market position. So I think the high value content um, uh, opportunity is, is, is something that I see um, being, being, being there for, um, for publishers. Technology is a second one, obviously, continues to drive value in B2B publishing. And I see no signs of this letting up. Uh, through our own recent experience, we've seen some really exciting opportunities to drive value in content, but also customer experience, personalization, networking. There's some fantastic opportunities there that are available to smaller publishers like ourselves. And I, I would say that it's not only is it an opportunity, it's a risk because the table stakes when it comes to technology, I think, are getting higher and higher. I think just to to be in a position to compete, you need to be uh, making those sensible investments in tech. And the third theme, I think I would I would point out, I mentioned it already, was was events membership. I think um, you know for publishers like like us who have a significant events component to their business, clearly uh, the future of events looks markedly different than it did uh, at the start of this year. And while there's every likelihood there will be. A return to physical events. There's there's also likely to be a stronger digital component of that um, of that events program, whether it's hybrid events, uh, fully virtual events, or, or year round events membership, as I mentioned uh, a moment ago. So there are some, I think, fantastic opportunities um, in what's going on right now in the in the events area. I think some some um, unimagined opportunities um, o- over the next six to twelve months that uh, publishers. Uh, may may well want to take advantage of. And is there anything else in the pipeline for Chemical Watch uh, that you haven't mentioned yet? Um, I think I've probably mentioned uh, most that we're going to be focusing on. I think the the the, the where next for us is really is really scale, like like I mentioned a moment ago. Fantastic. Um, so finally, outside of work, and we've already mentioned a couple of things. <laughs> What do you do to relax? Well, I'm looking for my next challenge. I, I, I sadly had to um, give up the, uh, the the fire service when I relocated to Bristol. It's all whole time, so I can't, unfortunately, can't um, can't carry carry that on at the moment. So I'm looking for my next challenge. If anyone's got any suggestions, <laughs> um, but but beyond that, I'm I'm a keen park runner. I don't know if you're familiar with park runs, but uh, yeah, Saturday yeah. mornings at nine o'clock is my my uh, my regular five k. Um, aside from that, usual stuff spending time with family and uh, I'm, I'm um i'm a keen cook i won't say i'm a good cook but i'm a keen cook um so so enjoy cooking and you know usual usual things really creature comforts well richard butterworth thank you very much for being our guest on the in publishing podcast absolute pleasure good good to talk to you Keir. A big thank you again to Acorn Web Offset for sponsoring this podcast. If you're looking for a new magazine printer, then check out their website at acornweb.co.uk or contact Matt Carey on 07714 299 105 or by email at matthew.carry at acornweb.co.uk. Thank you very much to Richard for being our guest this week. You can find out more about Chemical Watch at chemicalwatch.com. We hope you're enjoying our podcast programme. If you have any comments or feedback, then we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is editorial at inpublishing.co.uk. Thank you for listening and please join me next week on the In Publishing podcast. <laughs>